We're going to talk about the perceptron algorithm. The perceptron algorithm is the first of several learning algorithms that we'll encounter, all of which learn linear classifiers. The perceptron might be the oldest of that class. We'll be looking at uh, uh, at a high level, this unit is going to cover the perceptron algorithm itself, the mechanics of it, um, some variants of the perceptron algorithm, um, and with those, you'll have everything you need to uh, implement everything in your homework. And uh, most likely, in the next lecture, we'll be looking at the perceptron the sake box. So let's uh, dive into the perceptron algorithm. The perceptron algorithm produces linear classifiers. We are going to just, just a quick uh, recap of linear classifiers. The inputs are some d dimensional vectors. So there are d features. All of them are real numbers. Collectively, I'll call them x. The output y is either a minus one or a plus one. Minus one, can, you can think of it as false. Plus one is true. A linear threshold unit or a linear classifier assigns a weight for every feature. We'll call that WI. And at prediction time, what it does is it multiplies, a new input comes in, a vector X. It multiplies every feature with its associated weight. So that's WI XI. Add them up. So that's the summation of all WI XI, which it turns out is exactly the same as the dot product of the vector W with the vector X. So you take the dot product of W and X, I call it W transpose of X, add a real number called a bias, and you get a number. If that number is positive, this classifier predicts plus one. If that number is negative, this classifier predicts a minus one. The classifier, the behavior of this classifier is entirely defined by the assignment to these values, W and V. So change W and V, you get a new classifier, which means the job of any learning algorithm is to figure out what's a good set of Ws and Vs so that uh, uh, it, it, does, it does whatever is uh, the right thing. In this case, it stops making mistakes. We've seen this before. Um, sometimes you might see pictures of this kind. Um, so uh, you know, the inputs are associated with these nodes, x1 through xn. There's one node called that takes the value that always is a constant, the number one. And the wires carry the weights. The wires carry the inputs to this summation node. Along the way, they get multiplied with the, the associated weights. The number one gets also multiplied with the bias, B. The summation node adds all of them up. So what we have here is W transpose X plus B. And then you take the sign of all of them. So this sort of a picture, I'm kind of uh, foreshadowing what we will encounter later with neural networks. We're not going to talk about this right now, but this is it's like a primitive neural network. The interesting thing about linear classifiers is that their geometry is very well understood. Um, in two dimensions, the linear classifier draws a line on the plane. So it's, when I say two dimensions, that means that you have two features that define inputs, which means you have a plane in all the inputs lie on that plane. In two dimensions, the linear classifier draws a line somewhere on the plane and says one side is positive. And uh, in three dimensions, a linear classifier corresponds to a plane uh, that slices the space and says one side of the plane, uh, plane is positive, the other side is negative. In higher dimensions, it's a hyperplane. The geometry of this is well understood because uh, we, you know, we know how lines and planes and hyperplanes work uh, just because we know geometry. Their geometry is very well studied. The two sides of uh, that hyperplane are called half spaces. So the linear classifier partitions the instant space into two half spaces and says one half space is positive, the other one is negative. I'm just kind of saying the same thing in many different ways. Okay, so we've seen all of this before. Now let's talk about the perceptron algorithm. The perceptron algorithm is one of the oldest machine learning algorithms uh, that is still kind of fairly uh, uh, current. Uh, it was uh, formally first published in 1958 uh, by uh, in this paper by Frank Rosenblatt. And uh, it, but earlier versions existed even a year before. And it was presented as uh, 
a model for a probabilistic model for how information is stored in the brain. Um, this was uh, a rather uh, optimistic time in history, let's say, um, uh, where uh, we will talk about that later on. Um, historically, the, uh, the, the algorithm that Rosenblatt introduced is called the positron algorithm, but ideas that are essentially identical to this algorithm existed in some papers in 1954, a few years before, except they were kind of shrouded in mathematical optimization uh, terminology that nobody really noticed that this is also a learning algorithm. Um, the goal of the positron algorithm is to find a separating hyperplane if such uh, one such thing exists. And the curious thing about it is that it comes with a guarantee. It says, if your data can be separated by some hyperplane, your positron will find a hyperplane that perfectly separates the data. And this is the mistake bound theorem that we'll prove next week or in the next class. In the context of what we've seen in this class so far, the positron is an online algorithm. In fact, it's a uh, mistake driven algorithm, uh, but uh, it's an online algorithm in the sense that it encounters one example at a time. It sees an example, makes a prediction, and then the true, to, uh, then only after it makes a prediction, it reaches out for the true label. If the true label is not the same as the prediction, in other words, there's a mistake, it makes an update. So it's also a mistake driven algorithm. Uh, one of the things about the position algorithm is that uh, given that it's so old, uh, there are numerous variants of it. And we'll look at uh, some of them uh, later on today, but there are many, many, many variants of the perceptron. So if you want to know what the perceptron is, it's basically this sort of a black box for now that can take a data set. And if the data set is linearly separable, it will find a separating hyperplane. Okay. In terms of, let's formalize this out. Let's make, let's look at the mechanics of this and then, uh, then get into the intuitive and uh, try to understand this, uh, the, uh, like what it actually does. The input to this is a sequence of examples. Each example is a feature vector XI associated with a true label YI. So you have a pair X1, Y1 uh, uh, that get processed first and then X2, Y2 and so on. Each xi is a d-dimensional vector. So x, each example lies in Rb. Each yi can either be minus one or plus one. So it's a binary classifier. Or it's a, it's a, this task involves binary classification. This setup is going to be very similar to what uh, uh, many different, uh, this is the first of many different slides we've encountered many times in the semester that look very similar. So we'll see this multiple times. The perceptron, what it does is it starts off with an initial guess for the weight vector. Without, uh, you know, let's not make it too complicated. Let's say the initial guess for the weight vector is just the zero vector. It's just all the weights are zero. Here I'm assuming that the bias term is one of the weights in the weight factor, which means that I'm assuming that we have something that looks like this. Let me zoom in here. We have something that looks like this. All of these together form the weight vector. In other words, there's a single extra feature, the bias feature that's always present. So this is a, 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 a something that I mentioned at the end of the linear classifiers uh, when we introduced the linear classifiers, where rather than keeping track of the bias term as an extra thing, I can just pack the bias as one extra weight by adding a bias feature. Yes. Um, for now, let's not worry about it. For now, let's just, because the theorem does not require um, the it, it will change the mistake bound. Um, it will change the mistake bound, but it does not change the, the behavior of the arm. Yes. Uh, I've been going back and forth. So you want to go here? You just said that he was included in W, right? Yes. Shouldn't that then be R D plus one? No, I'm just no, the examples were D minus one dimensional. <laughs> but it's 
Yeah, the deep dimension is the bias. Oh, so you're good then. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't tell you what D was. So, um, yeah. Okay, also, actually, if you initialize W0 to zero, then you will also initialize the bias. Really. Yes. I'm initializing all the parameters. Together, the bias and the weights are called the parameters of the problem. I'm initializing all the parameters to zero. Okay. And now, the perceptron algorithm looks like every other online learning algorithm. So learning proceeds in rounds. At any point of time, we encounter one example and only one example. That example right now is XI, and which has the label YI. In any online algorithm, the first thing to do is to make a prediction. The linear classifier, the prediction with the linear classifier is uh, just the dot product. of the, You take the dot product of the weights and the features and you look at the sign of that. So you have sign of WT transpose XI. WT here is the current set of weights right now. Okay. So currently the weights are at this point, current is WT. And uh, the example comes in, you make, you take a dot product of uh, that example, the weight in the example, you take the if it's greater than zero, you say plus one, otherwise it's minus one. So you have a prediction, y hat. Now, like any other mistake driven algorithm, we have a, uh, uh, a, a check for a mistake. If y hat is not equal to the ground truth, if y hat is not equal to y i, then you have a famous perceptron object. The perceptron update, I'll just read it out now, and then we'll kind of analyze this, uh, uh, kind of look at this from multiple perspectives. It says, if there's a mistake, you update the weights. You were sitting on the weights WT, you construct WT plus one. WT plus one is nothing but the sum of the weights times some number R times YI XI. YI is the label, minus one or plus one, Xi is the input factor. And this is the entirety of the algorithm. So one of the, uh, you, you keep doing this till you run out of examples and then the final weight vector is whatever it is, is the, is the thing that this algorithm returns. All I've done here is describe the mechanics of this algorithm. You've not looked at why this works. You've not looked at any intuition for what it is and so on. So let's, uh, just a few different, uh, uh, things to note. Prediction here is the sign of W transpose X. Of course, always remember that there's a bias term. It's really uh, W transpose X plus B, but I'm just assuming that there's the B is part of the W. Uh, there's a question, what is R? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <coughs> the other, yes. Um, so why is Y vector this term? Y is a single label. Y, so yeah. notice that Y is just this or this. Y I is either minus one or one. X I is in R D, just like W's. And R is a single real number. Yeah. In the more complicated or realistic versions, it is. But in the simplest one, in the version that uh, for which the theorem can be easily proved, it's a constant. Yeah. Here, yeah, x is a hidden Yeah, y is similar. So that means scalar model. Yes. Yes, that's right. You are multiplying the scalar with the vector. And r is a scalar. R is a scalar. Yes. R is a real number. Um, just a, another sort of a logistical note. Um, I've been kind of fluidly jumping between representing true and false as plus one and zero or plus one and minus one. And in perceptron, it's easier to represent false as minus one. And that's the convention that we'll be using. So importantly, before we talk about the R, remember that I and YI is just plus one or minus one. Plus one means it's a positive example. Minus one means it's a negative example. So I can kind of uh, split this into two possible cases. If the true label is positive, if yi is plus one, then you have, if it's a mistake on a positive example, 
So I can just plug in yi is plus one right here, and you get wt plus one is wt plus r times xr. For now, pretend that r equals one. Let's come back to that later. For now, pretend that r equals one. It's just saying, if there's a mistake on a positive example, you have your weight wt, you have your example xi, you just add your example to your weight. If yi is minus one, on a negative example, let's say again r is equal to uh, one, then you have wt, wt plus one is wt minus xi, because yi is minus one. So if there's a mistake on a negative example, all you have to do is you take your weight and you subtract the uh, uh, input from the weights. This is the entirety of the algorithm. I keep saying that because it's deceptively simple. It's really simple, but yet it has very interesting sort of geometrical properties and it has very interesting convergence properties. R, that several of you asked, is called the learning rate. Sometimes it's called the step size. Think of it as a small positive number. Uh, typically, it's much less than one, but uh, uh, there are, there's like a whole cottage industry of choosing the right learning rate. For now, let's assume it's a constant, um, something less than or equal to one or less than one. It, it, it's not going to affect a lot of things that we are going to discuss uh, in, the, in at least today's lecture. This is a mistake-driven algorithm. That means this update is triggered only if the prediction y prime is not the same as yr. So if that happens, then you make an update. If that doesn't happen, life is good. The algorithm just continues. And the final thing is, uh, um, I can write this idea of why um, this concept of a mistake more compactly as y w transpose x less than or equal to zero. And that, that requires an empty page to explain. <laughs> So the claim is if the mistake is the same as y i w transpose x i is less than or equal to zero. Let's kind of uh, consider what's going on. So I'm going to write a small truth table here, w transpose x i. Y. Let's say this is positive and yi is plus. What's the prediction? What's uh, What would the prediction be from the current set of weights? That's plus one. So the prediction is plus one. yi is also plus one. So no mistake. And what is yi, w transpose <laughs> xi? It's also positive. If this is positive and the prediction is minus one, sorry, the ground truth is minus one, then it's a mistake. And yi w transpose xi is negative. And similarly, this is, this is negative and this is plus one, then there's a mistake. And this is minus or negative. And if this is minus and this is minus one, no mistake. And you have positive. So a mistake corresponds to the product of yi w transpose xi being negative. So I could have compactly written this the entire algorithm as if yi w transpose xi is less than or equal to zero, update. And here it is for xi comma yi in beta. I could have written the entire algorithm with just these three lines, right? Because I don't need to. So I don't need to make a prediction and then an update. I can just say if there's a mistake, make an update, and the mistake is when y w transpose x is negative. Any questions about this simple uh, sort of a thing? Yeah. So, so we start out with the fact that we are Yes. Um, and then start updating the algorithm. So that it gets fitted to the accent. Um, the, there's a lot that you just encapsulated into the word being fitted. What does it mean to say is being fitted? So, so like, like if you sample, like, 
adapted from so that it is returned to the right sign of, of y axis. Provided it originally returned the wrong sign of y axis. Yeah. yeah. That's, some, that, that's what you're doing. Yeah. Yes. I don't understand the question. And then if you set the minus one, or one is there? Minus one is a label, it's not minus one and one are just true and false. So where is the mistake is when the prediction y prime, which is a plus or a minus one, is not the same as yi, which is a plus or a minus. It's basically checking for equality. And the error happens only if they are un, not the same. Yes. So this only works. So you'll train this up with data and then you just use the trained algorithm. You can't just use it after. That Actually, that's an interesting question. In the original perceptron paper, there was no concept of you train today and then you evaluate tomorrow. This is an algorithm that lives forever. This line does not exist. So it encounters data, makes a prediction, gets feedback, updates itself, and uh, keeps uh, you know keeps existing. But in practice, in your homework, for example, you only have a finite number of examples. So you'll train it and then you'll use the final weight vector to evaluate. Yeah. Yes. Are we guaranteed to update on the vector um, so that we can change the right label every time? No. It's like if R is, if our learning rate is too small, can we not get it You might end up not updating the right There's no guarantee that after a single update, the perceptron would have, is going to correctly make a prediction on that example. There's no such guarantee. The guarantee that we'll encounter, which we'll see tomorrow or on Thursday, is over time it will get correct, but not necessarily immediately. So if I if it predicts right something incorrectly and I update it, it may still predict. It's possible. It may still predict right time for that X survive. It's still it could still be incorrect. Yes. Yeah. So just to make sure I understand. So the reason we have a negative or equal to zero is just because of the initial data, right? That's a very, very good point. In the only reason we have, let me zoom in here. The only reason we have a less than or equal to there is because think of the very first step. In the very first step, the weights were all zero. The weights are all zero and you don't put a less than or equal to there. It's, you know, the y w transpose x will be is not less than or equal to zero. It's equal. It's not strictly less than zero. It's equal to zero, which means it will count as no update and you'll never leave zero. Um, this is a common bug that you might encounter in your code, even in your homework. When you, if you are choosing to implement it with the YW transpose X less than or equal to zero as a condition for an update, if you accidentally put a strictly less than instead of less than or equal to, you'll find that your weight vector remains zero always. Uh, and uh, alternatively, if you rather, you can find, basically, you, you, learning will never happen. Okay, uh, rather than kind of hand-waving, uh, yes. No, so, the question is for when you make all the prediction correct. No, no, in, in, the, in the original um, algorithm, there is no stopping. No, this no. happens forever. This is a lifelong algorithm. There is... There is no training and test in this. It's an online algorithm. Online algorithms don't have a training phase and a test phase. They just exist. They just keep updating themselves over a lifetime of their existence. In practice, you stop when you run out of data because yeah, that's what we have. That's our, our hypothesis. Let's use the right. Yes. Yes. At every step. Yes, that's right. And there's like a whole. So that's a that's a good point. I'll repeat it. The choice of R dictates how fast or how slowly the 
the hypothesis will change with each update. If R is large, you are in, introducing a large change because you are adding R times X i. If R is small, we are introducing a small change. Yes. Uh, there is an algorithm, there is a variant called, uh, that's called the aggressive update. Uh, it, change, it, the way it does that, it doesn't move, doesn't do uh, what you just said. Instead, what it does is uh, it, given an example and the fact that you made, it's made a mistake, it updates the, it selects a value of R so that it corrects, it correctly makes the prediction on that example. So it chooses the learning rate adaptively. And it's a very cool paper called the passive aggressive perceptron or something like that. Okay, rather than looking into uh, a theorem about why this works, um, let's look at an intuition. Now I'm going to present the intuition for why this is a reasonable thing to do in two dem along two ways. Uh, there's a question, does the perceptron require input data to follow a bimodal distribution? There is no such assumption here. The the, there is an assumption about the data, but it's not about a bimodal distribution. We'll talk about the assumption uh, in the uh, in the theorem, but it's definitely uh, there is an assumption. So uh, I'm going to present the intuition for the perceptron algorithm first using just symbols, and then I'll show a, a, an intuition for this algorithm using pictures. Hopefully, one of them uh, speaks to you. So let's say we've made a mistake. We we currently are sitting on some weight. W, WT, an example comes in. That example is X. It's a positive example. And uh, the hope is the weight dot product with X is a positive number. But in fact, we find that W transpose X is negative. So clearly there's a mistake. Let's kind of unroll the update. So obviously this triggers an update according to the algorithm. So let's unroll the update and see what happens to WT plus one. Let's pretend that the learning rate is R because uh, just easier to not have another symbol. So the new weight vector is simply old weight plus X. So it's a mistake on a positive example. Okay, so now we can ask what happens to this quantity here? Originally, W transpose WT transpose X was negative. So instead I can ask what is WT plus one transpose X? So we can compare the dot product before the update to the dot product after the update. We, knew, we know that before the update it was negative. This is nothing but W T plus X transpose X, which is W T transpose X plus X transpose X, right? X transpose X is basically a perfect square. Oh, it's not a perfect square, it's a sum of squares. It's a positive quantity, which means this is strictly greater than, assuming that x is not a not zeros. Then let's make it greater than equal. To. Originally, this quantity was negative, and by adding x, we have produced a new weight vector such that w t plus one transpose x is more than that. It was negative. We have made it more positive. It could still remain negative. But we've pushed, we've kind of increased the value of w, the weights, the dot product of the weights in T. So eventually, hopefully, if you push it past zero, this will end up making the right prediction. And this is related to your question about are we guaranteed to get it right? No, we are only guaranteed that it will become less negative. Had R, the learning rate, been really large, R is going to show up here WT plus R times X. So R shows up, let me use a different color. R shows up here, R shows up here. So if R is really large, there's some value of R for which this quantity here will be possible. So if R is really large, you have gotten that example correct immediately. But we don't know what that is really. Yes. So on the very first example, the hard weight of the size is zero, mm -hmm. and then we take another example, and we think that we classify x to be zero at that point. So, uh, so the very first example is all the weights are zero. So 
WT transpose W0 transpose X equals zero. And by convention, the sign of zero is positive. Just, it's just a convention. So, you know, I am just, I've typeset the same thing that I wrote here because, uh, uh, you know, who wants to read my handwriting? Uh, basically, the idea is if you compare the weights after and the weights before, the weights after is less negative than the weights before. And so the update is doing something reasonable. So for a positive example, the perceptron update will increase, increase the score associated with that input. And I'm calling this quantity the score. I like to call it the score because it's, it's as if you are assigning a score to each example. I can, you know, I'm not going to go through the same process for a negative example, but I'll leave it as an exercise. You can go through the exact same reasoning for a negative example, and you'll find that on a negative example, if the model makes a mistake, a mistake means that weights, the dot product of weights and features is positive. If the algorithm makes a mistake, after the update, after the update on that example, the weights will become less positive. Okay, basically it's the same process, the plus becomes a minus. Here. Any questions? This is not a proof that the algorithm is guaranteed to work. This is not a proof that this is a mistake bond algorithm. This is just an argument, an appeal to intuition that at least it's not unreasonable. <coughs> Let me um, present the same intuition, but with pictures. And because uh, we can only have two dimensions in pictures, we're going to look at uh, uh, a two dimensional version of the perceptron algorithm. Uh, and in two dimensions, the linear classifier is nothing but a line. And to make my life easier, I'm assuming that this line goes through the origin. Imagine that uh, actually it doesn't matter if it goes through the origin, but it's just going to be easier to draw this. Imagine that we have a um, weight vector W. Currently, this has the, the weight vector W corresponds to this line here. And it's basically saying that all points on this side are positive and everything here is negative and the weights point in towards the positive direction, the normal points towards the positive direction. Now, let's say that a new example comes in. This example is a positive example, but we find that according to this particular hyperplane, the positive example lies in the negative side of that hyperplane. So it's X labeled with a plus one, that's on the wrong side. Before we move on, does this picture seem reasonable to you? Any questions about which one is the plus and which one is minus? The weights always point towards the plus. The, the normal always points towards the plus. So this side is plus and this side is minus. And so here, the, this is a point in the incorrect direction. That's right. There's a mistake on this example. The classifier predicts that this point is on the negative side. But actually, the ground truth is that this point is on the positive side. So let's now trigger the update. So this is a mistake on a positive example. And the update says W new is W old plus, let's pretend that the learning rate is one again, plus X. And now we need to go back to something that we learned in uh, I don't know, middle school or something where we add vectors by aligning arrows and such things. So we are going to update the weight vector w is w plus yx, y equals plus one. So yx is that red vector. You know, this is the parallelogram law for vector addition, or it has all these weird names. Um, so it's that dotted line is the new vector, and that's the new weight vector. Mm -hmm. What has happened here is that the weights were originally pointing in this direction. And now the update has essentially rotated the hyperplane. It has rotated the hyperplane so that after the update, in this case, it's a rather aggressive update. After the update, the example is directly classified. Questions? Right 
That's an interesting uh, question. It does not. So the question is, does this mean that after doing this, all the examples that came before will get incorrectly classified? And the answer is not necessarily, but there's no guarantee, at least looking at this picture, there's no guarantee that at least some of the previously seen examples will be incorrectly, will not be incorrectly classified. It's possible that some of the previous examples will get incorrectly classified. The guarantee that this will, in the long run, not happen comes from the mistake bound here. But right now, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's entirely possible that after this update, even the example that just came before that is uh, becomes a mistake. But it's an online algorithm, which means who cares about that example? It's gone. We're not going to encounter that mistake for example again. Right? We we are not going to example. We may not encounter that exact example. Yes. How exactly do you make you take the, the this process is the, uh, the the prediction is simply you take the dot product of the weights and the features, look at the sign of that. Uh, prediction for all linear classifiers is exactly that. Other questions? Yes. So we are like the XOR comes in, then this would basically just like spin in the circle. The error would just keep coming. If we have an XOR function, there's a theorem that says. This will keep cycling through uh, a set of weights called the perceptron cycling theorem. Other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. That's why I, I kind of hedged around this point that, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, that's a good and a subtle question. Um, in the d-dimensional space that I described, there is a one at the bottom. But that means our line is defined by the weights and the bias together. In the d-dimensional space, where the bias is part of the weights, it always goes through the origin. But in the d minus one dimensional space where the bias is outside, it's the perceptron update will not only rotate the line but also translate because the bias kind of moves it all around. Yeah, that that is kind of harder to draw in the uh, on the screen because uh, need to keep track of too many things and it just adds to the confusion. But that you're right. Yes. Do we have to do data setting for this, or do we just assume the bias makes up? The bias makes up for it. Yeah. Let me just go through the same process once again. If you if you don't have questions yet, and if this is confusing, let's go through the same process again, but this time looking at a negative example. Let's say that we are currently sitting on this weight vector, which say which means that everything here is going to be labeled as positive, and everything here is going to be labeled, labeled as negative. And an example comes in. It just so happens that it's the same example because uh, uh, I could not bother to draw things again. But let's say this example comes in X and it has a label minus one this time. But because the weights and the weights are pointing towards that example, that example is going to get labeled as a positive example. So the prediction is plus, but the ground truth, according to nature, is minus one. The ground truth is uh, negative, the prediction is positive. So there's a mistake on a negative example. So we trigger the update again. The update rule is exactly the same. W is W plus Y X, except Y is minus one. So Y X is the opposite. So if Y X points in this direction, Y X points in the opposite direction. So now we need to add, this was the original W. We need to add W minus X really. And so that gives us this new dotted line that corresponds to a new weight vector. And once again, the way the, the hyperplane has rotated around the origin and the new weight factor, it just so happens in this case, correctly classifies the example. What the new weight vector does is it says everything here is positive and everything here is negative. Questions? For in, in, in real life or for your homework or um, I have forgotten what I asked you to do. I think I asked you to use cross validation to find a learning rate. Um, I think that's what I, that's what I did, right? Um, 
Guru? Uh, I, I asked for cross validation, right? Yeah. So uh, for every variant of the perceptron, there are different hyperparameters, and I just threw in the learning rate as one of the hyperparameters. And in fact, this is the first of many, many future instances that we'll encounter where learning rate becomes a hyperparameter that you need to choose. It's true for the perceptron, it's true for the latest and the greatest uh, classifiers today. It's Search for cross hyperparameters is an eternal pain. Yeah. Uh, I think I, you raised your hand before, so we'll come to you and then. So, for particularly in linearly separable data set, uh, we might find the learning rate that completely separate uh, separates. Actually, you can do better than that. The perceptron theorem, the, the, the mistake bond theorem says, for a perfectly, perfectly linearly separable data, no matter what constant learning, if you if your learning rates are constant, you will always find a separating factor. No matter what that constant is. It's just like it's a little unintuitive and uh, it's, it's a remarkable set. Um, so in such case, we need to iterate the training set multiple times. No, you don't you, yes, uh, you could, but uh, you're I'm assuming that there's a stream of examples that keep coming rather than iterating through the training. Does it work for regression? It uh, does not quite work for regression. For regression problems, you need to do something else. Because uh, uh, if you're interested in that, you can look up something called the withdraw half rule. We'll talk about that when we talk about regression. You'll get an update that looks not too different from that, but it's not identical. The withdraw half rule is about as old as the perceptron algorithm in terms of. Yes. Yes. Uh, he, he, at that point, the picture becomes a little harder because the line might be something like this, and uh, you might end up moving the line and rotating the line, and uh, really the point around which the line rotates. It's easier to describe in the D plus in the higher dimensional space, it rotates around the origin. And I think that at least for me conceptually, that's easier. You can think about it uh, and see if it that helps or try to see if there's a different uh, visualization that makes sense. The good news about the perceptron is there are many of them. Uh, there are many, many variants of the perceptron algorithm, and I'm going to enumerate a few of them. In real life, we don't have an infinite stream of examples that we can keep um, uh, updating our model on. In practice, we have a finite number of examples, so we need to think of what we can do with a finite number of examples to stimulate this infinite stream. Uh, the other thing is uh, something called the voting, uh, the voted perceptron and the average perceptron which is really what, if you ever use perceptron, you should not use perceptron, you should use average perceptron. Then I'll talk about something called the margin perceptron. So the version that I showed before is the online algorithm, is the online version of the perceptron algorithm. In practice, we have a finite data set B uh, with a fixed set of examples, X, I, Y, I. And the the heart of the algorithm remains the same. In, what we do is uh, we iterate over the data many, many times. I'm calling that epochs. In each epoch, you just shuffle the data and then iterate through each example. This part should look familiar. You iterate through each example. If y w transpose x is negative, if there's a mistake, then w is w plus r y i x i. This, com this completes this loop completes one epoch. Then you go back and then you shuffle the data once more and then you iterate through the examples once again. In essence, what this is doing is you have a finite set of examples. You're shuffling it, creating a copy at, of it at the end, shuffling it again, creating a copy at the end. And this simulates an infinite stream of examples that keeps coming in. So all practical versions of the perceptron algorithm basically uh, have this sort of uh, this structure. In fact, it's not just the perceptron algorithm. Most uh, neural networks and uh, many other algorithms have a similar sort of structure. 
And at the end of this, uh, uh, at the end of T iteration, where T is de decided by when you run out of patience, um, you stop this iteration over the data set, uh, iteration over copies of you know, the, the shuffled version of the data set, and you declare learning as done, and you return the final bit. That's the final classifier that your algorithm returns. And at prediction time, a new example comes in. We're talking about a separate training phase and a generalization phase, like you had for your decision trees, for example. At test time, a new example comes in. You just take the dot product of the weights and the features and you take it such. This is the standard version of the perceptron algorithm that uh, most of the time, uh, uh, anytime, any, anytime anyone uses perceptron, this is what they use. Here we have a new hyperparameter. In addition to the learning rate, we have a hyperparameter t, which decides how many epochs we are going to run over the, we are going to iterate over the data set. How do you know what is a good number of epochs? How do you know what was good, good answer? That's a reasonable answer. Um, Later on, I'll say that uh, it gets more and more difficult, so we won't do cross-validation. We'll use other techniques, but for now, cross-validation. And I, I want to note that uh, I've used this shortcut for, um, that the, rather than saying, make a prediction and then an update, I've just said if YW transpose X is negative, is, is, is less than or equal to zero, then it triggers an update. Any questions? There's a question on Zoom. Is this based on gradient descent? In fact, it is. Uh, much, much later, uh, I'll argue that this is actually a gradient descent algorithm. For now, since we did not, we have not yet encountered gradient descent, I don't know what that means. Other questions? So this is, when I say perceptron, usually this is what I mean. Not the online version, this is the version that I mean. Let me uh, introduce a different variant now. So in this, in the standard version of the perceptron, at the end of learning, I return the weights, right? It's just the one weight vector that I return. Instead, imagine that the following thing happens. So there is, I can think of the perceptron as maintaining a weight vector, encountering an example, possibly making an update or not. So I can, if it does not make an update, that weight vector survives. And it goes to the next example. Here's the example. Maybe it survives that one also. It keeps surviving. Let's say that there is a certain weight vector, W, that survives 100,000 examples without any update. And then you have one more example. It sees this W sees that one example, and it triggers an update. So you get a W prime. So there is W that survived 100,000 examples without an update. And then there's W prime, which basically was freshly created just now. A question to think about is which of these is better? From the point of view of say future examples, is W better or W prime better? W prime seems like it should be the right thing because that's what the algorithm is going to return. Because it's the last weight, that's what it returns. But this example, this W that survived 100,000 examples, if future examples come from a similar distribution, maybe it's better to call ask W what the label will be because 100,000 examples got the right label according to W. Does the situation make sense? So the perceptron algorithm only returns the final weight back. This, the idea of voting is, says that let's not return the final weight vector alone. Rather than updating the weights, you keep track of every single weight vector that you encounter during training. You just put it in memory somewhere. Associated with that weight vector, you have a number. How many examples did that weight vector survive without any update? So in this particular example that I just gave you, W survived 100,000 examples without an update. So it will be associated with the number 100,000. W prime, let's start our count at one. Has is has a weight of has a um, is associated with the number one. So there are two weight vectors. The voted perceptron is not an efficient algorithm. In fact, it's actually like halving. It should really never be implemented. But it's this conceptual device that says, let's remember every weight vector that we encountered along the way associated with that weight vector. Just remember how many times it survived, and you return all of them. 
And when a new example comes in, you don't ask one of these weight, weight, uh, weight vectors for the labels. You ask all of them for the labels and have them vote on the label. But each weight vector does not get one vote. The number of votes that each weight vector gets is how many times did it survive. So a vector that survived many, many examples without an update gets a much higher vote. And you take the vote. Does it make sense? So does the mechanics of this make sense? This is called the voted perceptor. Yes. I don't know how to phrase your question. Okay. When you say when a weight gets updated, mm -hmm. that's kind of the weight it has for voting power. The number of times it survived without uh, an update. Well, you're also saying that when you make a prediction, you ask all of the previous weights. Yes. I, I, I test that. Only okay, so, so in this case, we actually do distinguish between yes, training. Yes, that's right, that's right. And during training time, it's just normal sets so you ask more Yeah, and except you just remember everything that came along. Okay. You, keep, you keep a trace of all the all the weight vectors that you saw. So this is called the voted perceptron. Um, the cool thing about this algorithm is that it comes with pretty strong guarantees, theoretical guarantees, about generalization. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, right now, but basically it comes with guarantees according to the probably approximately correct learning framework, back learning, which we'll see much later. Um, the bad news is that this is a terrible algorithm. You have to remember every single weight vector that you encounter along the way. Um, when I first saw this, I was like, yeah, you know, modern computers are big. Let's try to do this. Um, granted, when I did this, the computers are not as modern as they are now. But oh wow, it got so bad so quickly. Um, you know, it's worth trying. Yes. So I just the key for the maximum survival time is your history. You could do all of that, and there are variants of that that do that. Yes. This is the version that comes with the theoretical guarantee. But turns out this is not the one that you might implement. There's something called there's like a sort of an approximation of this called the average perceptron. The average perceptron says instead of keeping all the weight vectors, you just keep a running average of the weight vector as you, you as you, you as training progresses. And the final weight that the algorithm returns is the running average. This comes with no theoretical guarantees, but it kind of simulates voting in a loose sense, and it has similar behavior as voting. Let me show you the average perceptron algorithm. It should, it looks exactly the same as. The original perceptron as the standard perceptron, the, the batch version of the perceptron, except in addition to the weight, you also maintain a running average of the weight. Actually, I'm not doing a running average, I'm maintaining a running sum because uh, that's easier to do. At every example, for every example, if there's a mistake, I update the weight. And whether there's a mistake or not, I update the average, I update the sum here. And the final weight vector is simply that vector here. At test time, on a new example, I'm going to use A to make the prediction. This is called the average perceptron. Um, this is the version of perceptron that you might be, if, if you have to implement, this is the version that you should implement. Um, it's the simplest version of average perceptron. In fact, it's not super efficient to implement directly. It, you can, it's rather simple to implement directly, but there are some... There's a neat programming trick that you can use, which I'm not going to tell you, um, that that you can try to invent on your own, that makes it so that some quantity, not exactly this, gets updated only if there's a mistake. And at the final, you can, at the end, you can reconstruct this exact A with some massage. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but there's a sort of, a, it's like one of these uh, programming interview question type uh, things where you do some reconfiguration of your code and it becomes much more efficient where this vector addition happens only if there's a mistake. If you want to use the perceptron algorithm in practice, don't use the perceptron, use the average perceptron because you'll get like about 1% improvement just for free. Why not do it? We have three minutes left and I think that's about enough time for me to introduce the third variant of the perceptron algorithm called the margin perceptron. The perceptron makes an update whenever there's a mistake. 
And I said a mistake is when y w transpose x is less than or equal to zero. But what if it's not less than or equal to zero? If what if y w transpose x is positive, but it's 0 0.00001? It's a small positive number, very close to zero. It's almost a mistake. No, it's, it's a positive number, but it's almost a mistake, which means in the geometry, that example is really, really close to the hyperplane. It's uncomfortably close to the hyperplane. So rather than defining, rather than triggering an update when y w transpose x is uh, less than or equal to zero, you trigger an update when y w transpose x is less than or equal to some number eta. Eta is a small positive number. Could be one, for example. It turns out this generalizes better, but at the cost of another new hyperparameter, eta. So as we play the machine learning game longer and longer, this is uh, we start collecting hyperparameters, uh, and, uh, and all of them are identified by uh, by uh, cross validation. In the last minute that's left, let me go back to the original paper. Um, this paper was uh, this uh, paper introduced the Poisson algorithm in 1958. And what it did was it triggered like this crazy, crazy hype in the media. The kind of hype that Perceptron triggered is very much like the kind of stuff that we see about chat GPT in New York Times today. Um, so this uh, this article here from New York Times says the Navy revealed an embryo of an electronic computer that it expects to be able to walk, talk, see, write, and reproduce itself and be conscious of its existence. Um, just to be clear, we are talking about this algorithm that is W T plus one equals W T plus R Y X. And the article says it's going to be conscious of its existence. So, you know, I'm just putting this up there to note that, you know, New York Times is not always ground truth. <laughs> um, also, this algorithm was invented at a time when computers looked like that. Um, they, this was before digital computers existed. So it's really, really a cool uh, artifact. Okay, that's the end for now. Uh, what you need to know is what's the algorithm, what's the geometry of the update, what it can represent, and the way, many variants. At this point, you have everything you need for your homework, so please get started. There's a, uh, on Zoom, do you ever divide by the number of examples uh, for uh, averaging? I don't, uh, because we only care about the sign of the uh, the the dot product and the dividing by the number of examples does not change the sign. Uh, 